When I say the acronym EVX, those of you who have programmed using this ISA probably either groaned or perked up in anticipation for blazing fast performance. It's one of those things that some people like and some people just don't, which is perfectly okay. However, a lot of the conversation surrounding this instruction set is often lacking the understanding about what supporting said instructions entails, and how it allows you to build your software in creative ways while boosting performance. I'll also give some real-world examples as to how I personally utilize AVX to accelerate image processing, and how you can apply some of these AVX concepts when programming for other types of hardware. AVX, also known as the Advanced Vector Extension, is a single instruction multiple data extension to the x86 instruction set architecture. Introduced conceptually in 2008 and supported in a shipping product in 2011, the first iteration of this extension introduced 256-bit vector registers in the ALU. These registers, which store multiple fused values together, are a series of SRAM cells that store one and zeros in a 256 cell long block. Registers can be different sizes depending on the specific instruction set, but in modern 64-bit processors you've got general purpose registers that are typically 64 bits wide. AVX ups the register sizes, and with the third implementation, AVX 512, the register width is included in the name, hinting at the 512-bit wide registers in use. While this may sound kind of useless, what this can be used for is applying operations to chunks of data, instead of going through sequentially and loading the individual numbers into separate registers. For example, say I want to process a vector of 32-bit floats. This vector can be of any size, however in order to process the elements, there are two approaches we can take. We can either use scalar execution, meaning we load each element into separate registers and operate on them one at a time, or we can utilize a SIMD instruction set to process chunks of the vector at a time, ultimately leading to less loop iterations being required in order to process the elements. This comes at the expense of applying individual instructions on certain vector elements, so if you're adding one element and dividing the next one for example, you're unable to do that in AVX, so if you're mixing your operations frequently, it's probably best to utilize a scalar looping function as it gives you more granular control. AVX allows the programmer to apply a single operation to different pieces of data, and this is where we get the single instruction in SIMD. Now this sounds similar to programming for a GPU, and when looking at the fundamental concepts, there are tons of overlaps specifically when looking at the idea of applying a single function to chunks of data. The difference between AVX and a GPU programming language, such as CUDA or OpenCL, is how to declare functions that utilize the ISA. CUDA for example allows the user to define custom functions and launch them on a specified number of threads. In GPU programming, these functions are called kernels, and how you launch the function is dependent on which language you're utilizing. AVX in contrast allows the user to define functions in assembly, making the learning curve much steeper and ultimately limiting what you can do in C or C++. This is a drawback of using AVX, and when you get down to the brass tacks, AVX only allows you to operate on a maximum of 8 floats per clock cycle for AVX2 and 16 floats for AVX512. GPUs in comparison allow the user to launch thousands of threads if needed but also comes with the performance penalty of communicating and transferring data over the PCIe bus. With AVX, this is all integrated into the CPU, ultimately making utilizing the ISA at a higher level easier when programming for a general purpose x86 chip. Keep in mind though that not every chip supports the same version of AVX, and detecting which version is supported is entirely up to the programmer. Speaking from personal experience, I tried writing an AVX512 function on my i9-9900K, a chip that only supports up to AVX2. This caused my entire program to crash as the CPU threw a seg fault without specifying exactly what was wrong. This is important because the different versions of AVX utilize different hardware, and if you're missing the 512-bit registers, you're going to have to emulate them using two of the smaller 256-bit registers, which ultimately kills the prospect of operating on data in a single clock cycle. Despite these negatives of the ISA, I personally use it to accelerate image processing in C++. Even though I've rewritten the algorithm to utilize CUDA since the writing of this video, the AVX version functions as a solid prototype and gave me some experience with concepts used in porting to CUDA. Let's go over some of the features of AVX though, and see which chips support what, as well as show you some code snippets to help you get an idea as to what's going on. Let's start with what chips support what. 
If you're interested in AVX 512, only chips from Intel currently support the ISA, with Ice Lake, Tiger Lake, and Rocket Lake chips supporting AVX 512. And even then, Rocket League doesn't support the Bfloat 16 extension, which I learned the hard way. I was kind of disappointed as 16-bit half floats could speed up my programs even more, but the doubling of the width of the pipeline is a nice inclusion if you're processing 32-bit floats or integers. AVX also supports processing of 8-bit characters, which can either be letters or integers, which for pixel and word processing helps the chip shred through data. AVX2 is supported by almost all chips made within the last 5 or so years, with Zen, Zen Plus, Zen 2, Zen 3, and Skylake all supporting the 256-bit vector extensions. Keep in mind that when running AVX instructions, your CPU will most likely downclock itself unless told not to. I personally like running my 11700K at 5GHz no matter what's running on the chip, but keep in mind you'll want to lock your voltage if you plan on doing the same. For whatever reason, the processor pulls almost 1.5 volts when set to auto in the BIOS. And I was able to lock my voltage at 1.33, which is a much safer value. I read in line and heard from Intel themselves that these high voltages aren't anything to worry about, but for me at least, they were uncomfortably high and caused my chip to overheat under a 240mm AIO. If you want to do some AVX work on a Rocket Lake chip as well, I'd recommend one of these voltage tweaks as my chip runs much cooler now. Now that we've got some of the specifics of AVX and its support out of the way, let's get into some programming. Alright, welcome to the C++ portion of the video. Right now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and start with avxexample.h. Just kind of wanted to show you guys how I'm defining these, just so we can get an idea as to how we'll be benchmarking them later on. So first we have the namespace avx, which is just the vector add. It takes two float vectors, or excuse me, two float arrays and adds them together and returns a float array. Linear does the same thing. I should have probably named the scalar, but linear does the same thing except it does so without avx. So. Let's go ahead and get into the functions and take a look at both of them. So you can see right here, this is AVX vector add. What it's doing is it's taking in the first floating point vector, or excuse me, the first floating point array, loading it into an MM512 register, which is what's going on in this line. Second line is going to be the same thing, except it's going to be loading the second floating point array into an MM512 register. And then the last one is going to be an M512 register uh, being used to store the operation from adding these two registers together. Uh, and then the last line is we're just returning it. So then the next function is going to be the scalar function, which is taking these two floating point arrays. First, it's declaring a 16 uh, float wide array. Then it goes through with a for loop and adds them together, these two floating point arrays together. And then it just returns the floating point array, which is does the same thing as the vector add. The vector add just uses AVX, and overall the function is a little bit smaller. So let's go ahead and get into the main function. And let's go ahead and drag race these two functions. So what I decided to go ahead and do is take two... Uh, two arrays, two 16 float arrays, and just fill them with numbers. It doesn't really matter what the numbers are, it just needs to be a float. So I just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and then 16 counting down to 1. And then we have the return array right here, or the return pointing array right here. So first what we did is we ran 4096 iterations of the vector add function. And then we ran 4096 iterations of the linear vector add function. First time we're using AVX, second time we are not. Let's go ahead and run it. And as you can see right up here, AVX execution time is 80 microseconds, scalar execution time is 142 microseconds. So we are operating on more data at once, meaning we can get more data through the system per clock cycle meaning we overall have to do less of these loops, or actually we're doing the same amount of loops, but as you can see up here, we're doing less loops because we have a for loop in the scalar vector add, but we do not have a for loop in 
the AVX vector add, meaning we're overall using less clock cycles because we don't have to declare the size T, don't have to compare it against 16, don't have to add one to it. Instead, what we're doing is we're just doing it all in basically three clock cycles. 